car and I was trying to remind him not too long ago actually I was sitting in in the audience uh, having attended not just not once but twice I would say two and a half times because one time I was here for for half of it one, even when I was an assistant professor so I did it during my PhD and then I used to come as an assistant professor and uh, so it's, it's just when Eric sent me that email I, I probably replied in less than 30 seconds because I was just so excited because I thought maybe he has made a mistake and I didn't want him to <laughs> change his mind so it was literally the fastest reply probably you ever got for this uh, so <laughs> so it's 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 it's, it's really a, an honor to be here and uh, let me also say that even though this is a, it's a school it's a summer school on economic theory I happen to be one of the lemon students from this group I, I'm doing more of empirical work so what I'm going to be talking today is I'm going to be presenting some data to you uh, on complexity of regulations hopefully this will stir some discussion and debate and we'll give you some ideas perhaps to, 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 to you know, do something interesting, uh, theoretical as well as empirical. So the title of today's talk is Complexity of Financial Regulation. And uh, I'm going to be, even though I'm going to be talking about bank regulation, financial regulation in, in, in general, this, this applies to you know, you know, other, other realms of, dis, of, of regulation as well. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll, 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 I'll talk about the trends uh, I'll assume for, for now that you know you may not be aware of all the details about bank regulation and how it's done. So I'll, I'll initially, you know, go into some of the details, and then we'll get into the the economics of what's really driving things. So if you look at you know if you look at uh, you know the last couple of decades, right? What you've seen, you, what what you've seen is that you know the financial system has become more and more complex. Okay, and and to match that, what what has happened is that financial regulation has also grown in its complexity okay and now if you if you talk to folks about you know what is driving the complexity of the financial regulation you get different types of responses on that uh, one is that you know the financial system is very complex and that requires a complex supervisory structure in order to sort of you know police such a system all right but there also are the critics who, who sort of argue that you know complexity could be there could be for example reverse causality out here which is that you know uh, a lot of complicated unnecessary regulation a lot of which which is implemented you know after the crisis you know in response to the crisis is what drives uh, the the uh, you know so the, so the so the complexity of the financial system is response to the complex regulation that's what i mean by by reverse causality there are also these negative there are also these arguments that you know there there are folks who prefer complexity and this could be larger players incumbents because complexity you know generates you know creates barriers to entry and that allows them to to generate uh, you know extra rents uh, you know so so you know given given the stuff uh, we're going to sort of try and understand what it is now you know i'm going to be looking at financial regulation but you know even in this discussion you'll see how does one define complexity in the data is, is is quite a challenge you know what does one mean by complexity and they're going to be you know legal scholars you know people working in in, in such area uh, tend to summarize complexity by you know how many pages are there in a certain document uh, and things like that right you know how many footnotes are there refer, reference to the other documents and they come up with some measures of complexity Okay, but this is sort of not really clear how this is measured, all right. Uh, and I, I, at the end of this, I'll, I'll say something about it. So, for example, when you talk about increasing complexity, this is about capital regulation of banks. Okay, so I'll I'll I'll, I'll just say a few things about uh, uh, capital regulation of banks, and I'll get into more details. So there is this view out here that you know uh, we've had this for a long time that bank failures are costly, all right. So when you know banks you know just like we, we, we when we t when we talk in public economics about you know uh, externalities when big banks fail they sort of generate negative externalities on the broader economy and the aim is somehow to prevent such bank failures okay so if banks left on their own they're going to somehow t choose a level of capital structure let me put it this way which is you know how they fund themselves all right such such that you know what will the, they'll choose a level which will be optimal for them but that may not be optimal for the society in general right so the social optimal will be different from what is optimal from a bank's perspective because when banks are taking certain risks etc they're looking at what is maximization for them
but they are not taking into account that once they fail, all right, they are going to actually create wider disruptions. Okay. So, there are all these things in place to prevent banks from failing. So, one such regulation is, is the capital regulation of banks, which says banks have to finance them with certain amount of equity or capital. Right? And the idea is that, and I am going to be a bit loose out here and then I get a bit tight. The idea is that, you know, this is the buffer in case a lot of loans of a bank default, there is still some buffer which will prevent the bank from failing. All right? So, this is, you can think of a very simple regulation as being some regulation on how much leverage the bank can have, where leverage is defined by the amount of funding that is in the form of debt and, 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 and something that is in the form of equity. Now, the reason why banks are argued to take on a lot of uh, debt is that, you know, there is, you know, debt somehow tends to be mispriced is, is, is the argument, which is, which comes from, from various channels. One is, you know, when banks become too, too big, they're big, you know, uh, they're often bailed out. And so, this too big to fail generates this subsidy on it. You know, they also have, we also have something called a deposit insurance scheme, which, which basically insures the depositors. And this is a lot of times provided by, uh, by, by you know, the, the central authorities. Uh, the Federal Reserve, for example, would provide it, or the Bank of England in the UK would provide such a thing. Okay. So, 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 those things drive the subsidy to, of debt which then means that banks would on their own take on a lot of leverage, right? Whenever you misprice or offer a subsidy on one form of financing, that means that banks are going to respond and take too much of it. But if they take too much of it, that then, you know, given that the cash flows are volatile, there would be states of the world where they would not be able to service this, these obligations and which would result in, in, in bank failure, all right? Now, the capital regulation, so Basel was put in place to ensure that, you know, banks hold some amount of capital. And this is how it started. This was, this was, uh, this is, you know, information that is coming from Andy Haldane article from, from the Bank of England. So, when Basel I was implemented, it was 30 pages long. It had basically five risk buckets. So, the way capital was set in this model was that they classified the portfolio into these, into five buckets. So, you can think of a bucket as one is, you know, SME loans. Okay, so small and medium sized enterprises and that would be one portfolio. And as long as a particular loan belonged to a certain bucket, there would be a rule as to how much capital needs to be set aside for that amount of, for that portion of, of lending for example. All right, so very simple, five buckets as long as, you know, once it's identified which, where the loan fits in, you would be able to calculate this. All right, so very simple way of, of regulating a bank. And you know, I was talking to Gillian Tett, who's at the Financial Times, and says, you know, this was quite simple. Even the, 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 the media could actually participate in it because they could actually calculate what the right, you know, amount should be. Very easy to enforce, all right? A lot, what was argued was that this was a very coarse regulation, very simple regulation. And what it did was it penalized, you know, risky assets in a bucket at the same rate as, as safer assets, all right? And then the argument was that, you know, there's been a lot of progress in finance and statistical science and we can actually model risk quite precisely. And then that is what then came in what is called a model-based regulation. So, instead of having these simple five buckets, which are used to set aside the capital charges, right? I'll, I'll talk more about uh, capital charges, but you can think of capital charges as, 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 as some sort of a Pigovian tax essentially. So, imagine that banks are sort of, you know, we worry about banks failing, banks would take on too much leverage. So, instead of, instead of allowing them to go and take on too much debt because of the mispricing of debt, what we're going to do is we're going to try and make, try, try and come up with a way in which we can make them to internalize these externalities. And one way of doing is to restrict how much uh, leverage they can take, right? So, this is, this is the kind of it. So, so cap, what was the date of uh, this was 2008, okay? So, so in 2008, this was implemented, and the idea here again, as I said earlier, was that there was a better, you know, we had made some progress in terms of how we measure risk, and instead of having a coarse regulation which penalizes or puts a capital charge or taxes all assets at the same rate, let's have a precise regulation which says riskier the loan, more capital charge, safer the loan, less capital charge, where risk and where more risk and less. This, the, the level of riskiness is going to be dependent on these models, essentially. All right. So, this is Basel II out here, a longer, of course, 
risk weights determined by these sophisticated models and this is what we're going to be talking today about these what generates this this complicated uh, regulation now these were internal models of the bank so the banks would actually you know propose these models to the regulator and the regulator would go in and verify whether these models are working properly so i'm i'm let me just give you a flavor of how this was done so so imagine a large bank like you know a, you know commerce bank in germany right would have you know a portfolio would have first of all instead of these five buckets would have about 120 to 150 different different portfolios is that clear and each of these portfolios will have its own model and these models would be calibrated using historical data so you'd run a simple regression where you would have y against here y would probably be some sort of a measure of default so imagine the probability of default run against you know some characteristics of this portfolio right and you would calibrate this and you would present this to the regulator and the regulator would then verify this and see whether this makes sense or not and then based on that would approve whether this goes this this is allowed or not allowed all right so that's that's how it would be done and once it's done there would be a mapping which would say this is the riskiness of this loan and this is the amount of capital charge tax that you need to put aside riskier loans higher tax safer loans uh, safer tax all right then in 2000, you know, five years later, 2013, Basel III, uh, you know, still relying on the models, you know, is getting more and more lengthier in, in, in many regards. And, uh, and that's, that's how people have motivated, you know, the idea that, you know, things are getting more and more complex. Now, if you talk to, this is again, I'm talking to very, you know, simple media people, and there's no reason why they should be able to understand it. Here, a lot of people could participate in it. Now it's become so complicated that you know it's only the experts who who know who know a little about it. Okay. Now this is not just about ba bank regulation. You can see this in all sorts of other things. You know the Dodd Frank Act. People talk about it. All right. I, I'm in this. I have worked a bit in this area as well. This is 848 pages of boring legislation. All right. A lot of academics in finance talk about the Dodd Frank Act, but I, I can assure you there are probably just two or three people in the entire order, in the entire academia. Maybe I'm exaggerating a bit, who actually read the whole thing. A lot of it is, you know, discussions over coffee. Someone heard something, and someone, you know. But you know, I've tried reading this one time, and you can't go beyond page, you know, page three. It's so boring, and you just fall <laughs> off to sleep. And the only people who really can understand this are essentially the big banks who have a team of lawyers. And what they've done is they've lobbied footnotes after footnotes. You know, so all the information is in these footnotes out there. So it's not, you know, the text would say a nice thing, and then they would do all these qualifications. So the only people who can understand this complex legislation are, legislation are these big banks who are, uh, am, am I record? This, this is going to be, on, I have to be a bit careful of what I say here. Uh, but uh, it's the big banks who can actually understand this legislation and, 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 and you can think of what it means. But, you know, you've driven media out, you've driven, you know, some academics might be understanding it as well uh, before I get into too much trouble. Um, all right. And this is sort of, you know, European rule making and other forms of legislation. There is this increasing increase in, 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 in complexity out here. Now, where I'm going to be going with this is going to sort of propose you know, just before we, I don't want to get too far ahead, but I want to, I'm, I'm, I want to propose this idea that maybe things are getting just too complex. And maybe a way of going forward would be to, you know, when we're hit by a crisis, to simplify things. Because one of the reactions that often comes up, and I would call this a knee-jerk knee reaction when, ha when crisis happens, is that we abandon first principle thinking. We layer legislation on top of bad regulation, and that creates more damage than good. And maybe one needs to think about how can we actually simplify some rules and that simplicity might generate more effective uh, supervision and things like that. So that's sort of where we're going to be going with, you know, what's the optimal level of regulation, of course, without answering such a, such, such, a, such a question. Now, there are all these theoretical arguments out there for why complexity, you know, what complexity can be do. You know, it can create sort of information, risk of capture by sophistication, can be strategically exploited by agents who understand it and, and also can create opacity to our outsiders, etc. So something, things that I've, I've all been. So what this this presentation, I'm going to give you some data now, you know, to say something about how this particular regulation, in particular the capital regulation that I was talking about, I'll get into more details of it. How this actually played out. This is this Basel one to Basel two type of stuff. How have banks responded to it? 
who are the winners, who are the lo losers, and things like that. And we can think, we can discuss a bit more on the political economy of such a such a complex regulation. Okay, so we're going to examine this reform essentially. All right, we're going to look at some data out here, which is uh, which is this movement from a coarse regulation, which as mentioned earlier, five of these buckets were in place, right? Where as long as a, a loan belonged to one of these buckets, it was a very clear what the capital charge is. And then one moved to this more sophisticated capital regulation in 2008, which was we would figure out what the riskiness of a particular loan is, and based on the loan, we would decide how much capital the bank needs to set aside. Is that, is that clear? Now, just to be very clear, you know, theoretically, right, such a regulation, a more sophisticated regulation that makes sense, right? Instead of having post regulation to the extent you can actually measure things precisely, right? The idea of he who pollutes should be taxed. That's the guiding principle behind, you know, a more sophisticated regulation. Instead of putting, you know, instead of taxing everybody in that bucket with the same tax rate, what you're now doing is this person is polluting, this loan is polluting more or has more externality, and therefore it should be taxed at a higher rate than 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 the other things. So I've already mentioned, you know, one of the reasons, one of the rationales for uh, for capital regulation is some sort of mispricing of debt, which generates, you know, some sort of a suboptimal financial structure or capital structure of the banks. The fact that these bank failures have these systemic externalities, there is this attempt to regulate it. And capital charges, which is what we're going to be talking about, should be thought of as this Pigouvian sort of tax uh, that's, that's, uh, that's going to be doing this. The rationale behind this sophisticated regulation was quite clear. It would actually lead to less distortion because a sledgehammer approach to regulation Rather than a more precise regulation would be would be would be good, and this would actually also perhaps steer banks towards safer portfolios. Because if you're holding a lot of riskier loans, then you're going to be taxed at a higher rate, and this would have a steering effect. All right. What I'm going to be showing you data on this is that that when this sophisticated regulation was implemented, this is how it played out. So I'm going to be showing you some data from Germany out here because I've been able to get hold of some very proprietary data from the Central Bank of Germany. So I'm going to show you some, some evidence on that. And what you will see there is that, so the idea of this whole legislation, of, of this, of this uh, regulation, as I said earlier, was to uh, you know, reduce these distortions, right? Let's tax these things at the, at a, at, at the right rate. And, and the idea was somehow this would enhance financial stability because it will steer banks towards safer portfolios. What happened after the implementation of this regulation was that there are two things that happened. One was that to implement this regulation, there was a high fixed cost component to it because it required a risk management system to be in, system to be in place. All right? So in Germany, when banks were asked, so this was an option given to the banks of who want to go in for this legislation and who want to stay, back, stay with the old regulation. Okay? What you see is that the players who said yes when this was given the option were the larger banks. All right. So the larger banks, because of the high fixed costs associated with this with this particular legislation, because you needed to have this risk management system in place, they were the ones who 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 who, who were okay with it. So of the 1,500 banks operating in Germ Germany, only the f only 48 banks went for this uh, model-based regulation. Yes, Mary. Are, are you saying that the other banks were permitted to stay under the old system? They were they were allowed to stay. Because the choice. The smaller banks were paying a smaller fixed cost. Yes, I'll show you a bit more on that. Okay. Yeah, so this is just, I'm going a bit ahead. No, so, so, so Basel II did not impose a severe capital. I'll give an example which people have paid attention to Northern Rock, which was a big British bank that failed in September um, 07. The irony is that in July of seven they were allowed to use their own risk model uh -huh. and say, great, we're going to do that. And within a week, they increased the dividend generously. So that was allowed. Within two or three weeks, they couldn't fund themselves. No, but more generally, what the gain is that you can uh, perhaps uh, pay less on some of the other Yeah, yeah, but if you... Yeah. 
No, so the whole idea, just because I'm going to show you that, the idea was that there is an upfront fixed cost which makes it less profitable, but to the extent that you can get these models validated and passed, which is what I'm going to show, banks were able to gain it by reducing the risk weights. Because these models, as, I, as I'm going to argue, are, are, you know, they're not Newton's law of motion. They can be manipulated. These are statistical models, and I'll talk about how the banks manipulate it, but I'm going a bit ahead right now, all right? So they were able to, so what ended up was banks actually having lower capital and holding more riskier portfolios, and this tended to be the larger banks. So the irony of this whole thing was that if you look at this, the reason for this regulation, it was, it was meant to fix this issue of too big to fail. But what it ended up doing was it actually provided a subsidy to size. And uh, the way it played out was that the big banks even became bigger. And, and the market structure, I'm going to show you something on the market structure, okay? So I'm going a bit ahead, but at least I thought I should give you a bit of a preview. Please. Uh, one second, I was told to give you the mic because they are... Uh, and you can pass it around to the next uh, person. There's another one here as well. Taking you a bit back, um, just uh, I was wondering about um, the purpose of the regulation. You said it was to avoid these disastrous events where banks fail and etc. Yeah. But obviously, um, we pay some price at regular times uh, implementing these sort of regulations. So that is uh, more costly, and maybe so there are some. Uh, I don't know, misplacement of loans, and maybe you, you have something to say about that? Or? Let, me, let me give you some, I'll give very simple graphs. I'm not going to get it too complicated, and, you know, and I'll, I'll try and say that. But let me present that, and then we can talk about it. Okay? I, I wouldn't be able to argue in an, with some data that you know, this is going to be suboptimal in a grand sense of things. But given what the stated objectives was, I can try and measure things based on the stated objectives. And, uh, and, you know, so I'll have that, that, that type of an analysis in mind. Yes, good. In fairness, the, the, the goal, one of the goals was to enable them to lend more money. And that's the kind of stuff that is very difficult to measure. So the relaxation of the regulation or making the regulation yeah. improving it yeah. has improved the bank's ability to support the economy. Yeah, so, so, no, so the objective was not for them to lend more. That could be achieved as well by, you know, if you have, if you have lower tax on things because, but the main ob objective was they, they said the way they thought this would happen was that this would, this would steer banks towards a bit more of safer portfolios or at least the risk and the capital would be more highly related in them in some sense, right? So you would, Basel uh, 1 was very coarse, so banks were holding too much capital and was not very sensitive to risk and they thought this would generate, you know, banks having Higher capital if they're taking a riskier portfolio, there's sort of a match between the two. Without them, you can shut up all the banks and then you have no risk. Sure. So, but you don't want to do that because the banks. No, no, absolutely. The the yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, so I'm not going to be, I'm totally with you. I'm not going to be saying that, you know, of course, one way of simple regulation, we just bank, don't bank lend too much, and that's also going to be suboptimal. Here is going to be just the opposite. It's not like you're putting in uh, an excess, you know, capital. So, some people would argue. So if you talk to, you know, Anathat Mati at all, they'll say, have a very high leverage ratio, all right? 20% leverage ratio. And that'll have this effect that that'll constrain the amount of lending that banks do, right? What I'm, what, what I'm going to show out here is that, is that this was a regulation that was intended to have, make safer banks and their capital to be more responsive to risk. What it ended up doing was it made, it created riskier portfolios with less capital. So now if, if, suppose something goes wrong with these banks, they're even less capitalized. Now you can question whether we need to have capital in place or not, but this is starting with the assumption that, you know, there is a view out there that banks need to hold this capital and it's going to be measured along those lines. Is that clear? So, so that's, that's, that's the flavor of this, this, this argument, okay? So I've, I've already talked about this. You know, if you think about, so this is actually, you know, to answer, this was implemented in 2007. But the data of it reflects in 2008 because you know, the data is after the reform. All right, so pre-reform framework, uh, this was the cost regulatory approach, you know, consisting of five, five buckets, et cetera, I've already talked about. And this is the post-reform framework, which was this complex array of these risk models calibrated by the bank and verified by the regulator. 
all right. So, banks would pre present their models to the bank and then the bank would say I like your model, I will allow you to put this portfolio under the model base approach. If they did not like it and they felt that they needed more data, they said we will keep waiting all right uh, and, and that would have. So, typically you know I think for a large bank you would have 100 different risk models each having many parameters, 400 parameters calibrated all right and of course, there is constant calibration and validation through this through the supervisor. Is everybody clear with, with the setup so far at least to the extent it can be? <laughs> yeah, all right. Okay. Each bank, yeah, so one of the response which I will talk a bit later was you know once you know we present this data to the regulators and, and they have tried to now incorporate this. One of the response to, by the regulators is that you know one of the reasons why these models did not do well because once you present these, this analysis to them is because we did not have enough manpower to actually supervise those models. Okay. I am going to argue that you know the regulator, the regulator will always be slower than the regulated. Okay. It is just the incentives works in a slight you know in a different way and they are asking for you know so post this they have asked you know Germany for example, the Bundesbank in Germany has advertised civil servant status jobs to to a lot of folks to come in and join these are PhD in mathematics etcetera, so that they can go to these banks and verify these models. This is how complicated it is getting. Okay. I am going to actually show you some data on this as well, I am going a bit random right now. You know the way supervisory structure is evolving is that then this is this is again data from the Bank of England paper that I am referencing out here by Andy Haldane. If you look at the 1980s right and I might be going a bit wrong, I might be saying some wrong numbers they will come inside. But there was there was one supervisor for, for some 10,000 people working in the finance industry. Now, there is one supervisor for 300 people working in the finance industry that is sort of how the supervisory okay. and then the cost of compliance you know everybody has to report on a quarterly basis you know I do not know 200 thousand. Oh yeah, there's a there's a revol there's a revolving do door as well. Yeah. Selection. Selection. The best people who understand that move to the bank. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. No. No. That's happening as well. That the yeah the people yeah okay that too. Okay. So post reform framework as I said it's it's a more sophisticated regulation and as I said earlier if everything could be done properly this such a regulation should be good. The question is how much can we trust these models and how much if, if there is a lot of issues with enforcement of these kind of things then maybe you know uh, a simpler regulation might dominate more sophisticated regulation. Okay. It is a very similar argument to you know to you know I, I always related to you know uh, Holmstrom and Milgram's multitasking model or something like that right. Uh, sometimes from the, that you can actually get a coarse regulation being a, 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 a dominant form especially when you have enforcement problems or difficult to measure one aspect of it. I will I'll, I'll say more, more on that maybe later. Okay, so, as I said earlier the benign view of Basel II is it resonates with this economic principle of he, must, who, who, he who pollutes must pay. In a world with no information and informational problems such attacks should foster stability and enhance economic efficiency, but there are these alternate uh, views. One is that these models can be manipulated and you, there are different variants of this, this you could call this a good hearts law or, or a variant of the Lucas critique which is that once these models are in place you know people have incentives to manipulate the inputs and that can actually have a you know it is so Lucas critique was more made for forecasting models, but the idea was sort of the same that you know once you, if you are trying to forecast something right there are limits to what you can do because once these things are in place agents are going to change their behavior and that undermines these models itself and same sort of stuff out here. Uh, this point has also been made by Glazer and Schleifer that in a world with enforcement, uh, with enforcement constraint, coast regulation may be, may be optimal. You know, Martin Helwig has this classic, uh, has this very interesting example of, um, of speed limits on motorways, uh, which is you know that you know if you think about you know it's a very simple rule. You know, if you go on the motorway in the UK, you drive at 70 miles per hour. Okay, you could think of a more complex sophisticated regulation where the speed limit is going to be determined by the number of hours you slept, you know what you ate for morning, what is your driving skill, what car you drive etcetera, etcetera and you wake up in the morning and something tells you today your speed limit is 83 miles per hour 
and you know economists are quite creative and says you know such a regulation could be welfare improving because you could hire uh, a most you know somebody who has a higher speed limit to take goods from A to B and this will reduce the travel time and the cost of transporting or whatever it is and some model will generate great things can happen by such a regulation all right but you can see this regulation could be very difficult to enforce and you know we have something which is a coarser regulation which is no matter what you who you are you can't exceed 70 miles per hour so that's an example of a very simple slash course regulation in place uh, I'm sure Eric has lots of other examples in mind but I'm <laughs> uh, all right and of course there is this regulatory capture view which is what you alluded to and Guru had talked about that not in the direct but there is also that point which is uh, okay uh, so, for the pur purpose of presenting the results, I'm going to be ca calling something IRB and SA, all right? And I just, just this brief, and I won't explain what it is. Whenever you see, I'll try to be a bit careful, but whenever, if I say IRB, this just means the model-based regulation, the sophisticated regulation, all right? And SA would just be the standardized approach, which is the old approach. Is that clear? So, there are these two approaches that are going to be there, which is this model-based regulation, and this is going to be the old course bu five buckets type of regulation. Okay, as I said earlier, due to the large compliance costs, cost, only the large banks opted in Germany for the IRB. Uh, now, the way it was implemented in the, the way it was implemented in Germany and different countries have different uh, variants on that, but it's quite quite similar. Is that these portfolios? So I talked about these 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 large portfolios, right? The regulator essentially decides what these portfolios are. So there's an SME portfolio, for example. Okay, I'm, I'm being a bit loose out here, but banks can't, you know, you, banks can't pick, to, you know, which loans belong to which portfolio as such. All right, so they have limits on what, how they can define these these things. All right, so when this reform was implemented, banks were asked how many want to go for the model-based regulation, and I'll show you that there's a large 45 some banks that said yes, they wanted to go. And what they did was they, sub they submitted their models to the regulator. Is that clear? And so what we can observe is we have that data from all these banks who submitted these models. Now some of these models, the regulator liked it after looking through it and approved it and says you can move this model to the IRB style, which is this model-based regulation. But these we are not really comfortable because there's a lot of noise around this estimation and we are going to wait so that we can get more data on it. And then two years later, when they felt comfortable, they allowed these portfolios to also be shifted to IRB. So we're going to look at a sample from 2007 or implemented, but 2008 onwards for five years. And there's a staggered passage of this because even though all these models were submitted to the, to the regulator, only some were transferred initially. So you have some that stay on the SA and some that stay on the, the, the IRB style. Is that clear? So looking at these 45 banks who are all opting to move on to the model-based regulation, not everybody can move to model-based regulation in 2007 and that generates a staggered introduction of this. All right. So this is, these are going to be, I'm going to give you four bar diagrams and everything else is just going to be tables based on this. So if this is clear, everything else is just going to say this is statistically significant. All right. So as I said earlier, of the 1500 banks that are, were operating, and I'm not sure whether it was 45 or 48, but it'll come right. Only these large 45, let's keep it at 45 for now, that said yes. So when the, when the banks were asked, these 45 banks said, said yes. Now, just to be clear, these 45 banks control 60% of banking in, in Germany. So even though they're 1,500 odd banks, the larger banks said, said yes to it. So what this is plotting, and this is done annually, all right, so these models are generating these PDs on an annual basis. What you have is a, is a blue bar diagram out here, which stands to the loans that still stay on the old approach for these 45 largest banks. Is that clear? All right, so, all, so this is looking within the subset of 45 banks. We're not, this, these diagrams are not about the banks that did not want to go into this model-based approach. These are the 45 banks that actually wanted to... I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about that. Yeah. So the blue diagram uh, represents the. Actually, I should probably say the vertical axis first. What the vertical axis is the probability of default. P 
PD stands for the probability of loan defaulting. And the way it's defined is, what's the probability that a given firm is going to default within the next year? In the one year horizon, what's the probability of default? Now, this is a very important variable because this is, as I'll show you, is directly mapped onto the risk weights. All right? So once I figure out from the model what your PD is, so the PD comes out to be 0 0.03 which means the probability of, with this characteristic, this firm defaulting in the year from now is 3%, there will be a capital charge associated with that particular PD, and banks have to hold that much capital for that particular loan. Is that clear? All right. So, this is not, this is not exactly a normal time, uh, 2008, Yeah, so, yeah, so there is this crisis happening. The, the thing about Germany that a lot of people have not appreciated is that the effect of the crisis was really minimal in, in Germany. Okay? And, you know, I can show you some of that stuff. But, point well taken, and, and, and we will we'll talk about how to think about the implications of that in just a bit. All right. Yeah, this is the PD of the whole portfolio, essentially. Yeah, in one year from now, so... I, I, so what, is, what, is, what, what, what they calculated at the portfolio level, right? The model is at the portfolio level, but then it's run at the individual level. So imagine there's a firm that comes in, let's say an SME, with a certain leverage ratio and all those characteristics. They would be able to calculate it. And then, of course, the aggregate would be the weighted average of the PDs that you're going to get it, which is going to be the same as... They will be the same thing in uh, the fraction. The fraction. Yeah, but but if 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 for example, some loan has a three percent probability of defaulting, right? So I, I think where you're getting it is that there could be a correlation between loans. Is that, is that where you headed with this? Yeah, but, but here's, the, here's the point I'm trying to make is that imagine that there are lots of loans in a given portfolio out here. Some with 2%, some with 3%, some with 1%. The weighted average of these probabilities is what the expected, what the probability of default is in the next one year. What happens is a different issue. All right? That has to be true. We can, right? So if, if it comes out at the weighted average, so if you have if you have two loans, 50% weight on each of these two loans, one has a probability of default as 4%, and the other has a probability of default as 2%, the expected probability of default of this would be something like that, right? So if there are lots of small loans, it would it would get that. Okay, let me we can talk more about it. So what this blue chart is showing is these are the SA SA portfolio. So just aggregating, there's not much being done out here. It's like which are what are the what are the probability of defaults averaged? right, for all these guys uh, who are on the SA loans. So again, looking at within the subset of 45 banks, so it says, the way I would read this is that in 2008, the blue bar would represent, so this would be 2.6%, so the expected default is 2.6%. Is that clear? For the red bar, which is the ones that have been shifted on the IRB side, the expected default rate is 1.5%. All right. So what you see, and this is being done every year, the models are being calibrated, and of course portfolios are moving. What you can see out here is that you get this impression from the from the chart is that the red chart out here, which is the models that have that the loans that have shifted to the IRB side, tend to have a lower probability of default. And it could be anything. It could be that the regulator prefers to, you know, okay, safer portfolios and things like that. All this is this is what it's showing. There was a question somewhere. There's a mic if you want to use it, but if you don't, it's fine as well. Just to see if I'm understanding, this is, these are the probabilities that come out of the specific models or are they realized default rates? No, these are just the probabilities coming out. Okay. We will look at the realized default rates in just a bit. This is, mm -hmm. I'm standing in 2008. Yeah. This is saying is, what is the expected probability of default based on the information you have in 2008, one year. So in 2009, I can see how these models, how these loans fared compared to what the predicted probability was. And the data allows to check, for example, if I, although the regulator asks me to use the SA loans, can I use my IRB model? I mean, if I have the data, can I just use the model to see 
how these relate if they're similar in the way the, they, pre they have the, this prediction of probability. Yeah, so I'm going to do that. But these are all, by the way, even though I'm calling them SA loans, these are all portfolios that want to move to IRB. So they have submitted their schedule or their models to the regulator. That's how I can see it. Does that make sense? So these are the IRB models. It's just that they've not been implemented yet. They've okay. not been allowed to go to, to the model-based approach. Okay, there was another question somewhere here. Okay. So what you can see out here is that this blue bar, this is the image I want you to get, is above the red bar for whatever reason. All right? Could be safer, etc. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. These are the estimated. So in 2008, there is no default. I have run these models and these blue charts you know, the probability of default or the average probability of default is 2.5% and the, and the red chart is 1.5%, all right? Now I can go and track these same guys and say how many of these loans have defaulted based on the same approach. So I can calculate the realized default, which is what you're after, which is the next graph out here. So what I want you to remember is that this is the blue and the red, blue being the old approach. Now if you see the actual default, what you see is just the other side. And I'm not going to say much on it. There can be a lot of things. You know, they can have different exposure to macro factors. As you said, there was a crisis. These loans could be very different. But I just wanted to somehow point this out is that the default actually of these are those loans that have shifted to this are actually higher. Is that clear? Now, that also means that it's less precise. Uh, the ones that have shifted there, right? It seems like Could be. Yeah. 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 So sophisticated models, the gap is much bigger. Yeah. So we. So maybe not so yeah. So we we're, we're going to entertain all possible things. I'm just presenting right now. It okay. could be that the regulator allowed certain models to go through, which should not have been allowed to go through, and stuff like that. We will entertain all possible things. I'm just saying is. At the starting point, this is how they're looking, and I'll go through each of these mechanisms and what drives these results in just a bit. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So this is, I, I talked to this as well. So I said, you know, I showed these charts. I said, you know what, this doesn't require rocket science. I've just taken your portfolio, and I've calibrated that, right? You could have seen this yourself. What happened? What was your response to this? And, gen and, and, and what I learned was that it's actually very difficult, and there was a lot of interesting stuff happening, which I'll talk about. Okay? But it's not really easy to see some default model not working and then attribute it to something going on wrong, because you know, the amount of confidence you need to say some manipulation is happening, the amount of time series data you need to establish that is quite long. So even though, you know, I, so I'll, I, we'll have to do more analysis to actually nail it, nail it down, but this is the pattern. All right. Now, there are all these, we all, you know, you've already alluded to some stories, but there's always, you know, stories which is, one is these pools are different, the economy moved in a certain way, the IRB loans have different sensitivity to these macro factors, and therefore just their default, you know. Even a good model can have a bad performance if something happens, right? That doesn't make it a bad model, right? So, so we're going to talk about that. Now, and it could also be that you know banks were gen banks were genuinely surprised by this, which is that you know what they thought it was safer, and somehow a turn of events generated bad results. So what now? There is something which I, I'll mention earlier. As I said earlier, this is a very important variable that goes into how you determine what the capital charge is. Okay, so for a lot of banks, this is the primary variable, which is the probability of default. There are other things like loss given default you know, correlation, you know, maturity, et cetera. But those are hardwired by the regulator for most banks. All right? So there was a formula which would map the PD one-to-one -one for most banks with what is called risk-weighted assets. But all you need to think about risk-weighted assets is a capital charge. Is that clear? So if, if you look at, so the actual defaults are higher. If you calculate the risk-weighted assets, this is just one-to-one -one mapping with the PD, which is not surprising. The blue chart is going to be higher. And if you look at the loss rate, it's going to be that the loss rates are higher for the red ones as you saw for the defaults. Now, here's the interesting part, okay, for a subset of this thing. If you look at what the interest rate the banks were charging on these loans, to the, ex to the extent interest rate actually gives a measurement of how they've perceived the riskiness of the loan, all right? 
what you see is that while the PDs did a bad job in predicting the defaults, the interest rates line up quite nicely with how the default actually panned out. Does it make sense? So if I was to say that interest rates, and this is like, you know, I'm trying to invert too much and still there are lots of issues out here. If you believe interest rate is the bank's assessment of the risk and PD is what they're reporting to get a certain capital charge, I've showed you that PDs were a lot lower than the actual default rates. If you remember, the blue chart was above the red chart. The actual defaults were the opposite way, which meant that PD did a poor job in predicting default. The interest rate, if you think interest rate could be inverted to the perception of risk by the banks, actually lined up quite well. All right? So this seems to be, it's not like the banks were not aware of the risk that they were, that, that of these riskiness of these loans. There was one thing is what they're reporting to the regulator to get a capital charge, which is lower than what it should be for this. And the other is this, okay? Now, there could be other stories as well. But, but these are the five graphs which we'll discuss in detail and try to come up with alternate. In other words, you come to your bank and you charge as much as you can. So there is that also other banks are thinking about this now. Yeah, so I'm not saying this is perfect. It could be. Fair enough. So interest rate is not a perfect measure. You know, in a competitive environment, it does reflect the riskiness of the loan. There could be. Reason, there could be reasons why certain people get charged a high interest rate, which could relate, which could be related to their competitiveness or the market structure. Is that what you're right? Uh, what if you get another bank? Because interest rates charge you for your opportunity interest rate. No, no, sure. But I'm saying is that if there's enough competition, you're sure that you should shop around and find another bank. Because if you have another bank, you're going to get charged more. Because interest rates are going to be higher. Yeah, but that would, if, if there's enough competition, you should think that that to some extent would be, you know, you should think that that would be if there's enough competition, you should think that that to some extent would be, you know, I'll get my lower lowest. I agree, but it's not. No, it's the bank's perspective of. No, I. Rates are charged reflect not only their own lender's perception of rates, but other lenders' perception as well. Sure. I mean, there could be some element of what do you call a winner's curse out here, right? So imagine if I'm offering different models are coming up with different uh, interest rates. The individual is shopping in, right? And th but that would be in line with what I'm, you know, some sort of. That you're going to be picking up the one that suits you best. Okay. Here I'm saying is that to the extent that these, these, if I look at the loans given by the banks, the actual default rates and what they are asking for the interest rate, it seems like it's going. It's 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 suggesting that it was not low risk because if the banks thought it was low risk, they would charge a lower interest rate to be competitive in that. That's the argument I'm trying to make out here. When banks were proposing their models, yeah, they, like. No, so this comes from a different data set. The regulators don't get to see the interest rate. And there are some proposals out there which is banks should report the interest rate as well. So yeah, this is coming from a different. Like, yeah. Like a, a major omission, right? So there are lots of discussions on this as well. So Charlie Calamaris would argue that, uh, you know, would say interest rates should be known to the regulator and we should have directly looking at interest rates and that's what we should use to set capital charges because that's the way we know what the risk is perceived by the bank. But then interest rate can be, you know, there's so many dimensions, price and non-price dimension to the interest rates. How does one think about fees and all that stuff? But it's an interesting proposal, which is, but there, at the moment, it's not in the, in, 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 in that. All right. Uh, Guru, you had another point? Okay. So this is what the pattern is that I want you to remember. Uh, we're doing okay. This is the pattern that, which is what, what we're going to try and see what's really going going on with this with this data, and of course, you can have a discussion on it. Which is that there are these PDs of IRB models, their perception of risk. It seems like the SA portfolio is perceived to be higher risk than the IRB portfolio. If you look at the actual defaults being realized, it's the other way. PDs do a poor job in predicting defaults. But if you look at what the interest rates that banks are charging on these loans, it seems to line up well, at least suggesting that banks are uh, aware of the risk they're taking because they generally thought these were safer loans because they're reporting lower PDs for these loans. They should have also charged a lower interest rate for that loan to reflect that lower riskiness. Right? It's, none of it is proof, so we have to go further into the analysis and try and, try and sort of make sense of that. But that's sort of the flavor of it, uh, of, of of, of the of the discussions. Everybody okay? All right. So I've already mentioned uh, 
this the way I, I, I don't want to get into the technicalities of it. So the risk weighted assets, if ever it's used, think of it as a capital charge. But it's a bit more than that, which is it's multiplied by eight percent. Okay, so so but here's the mapping that is really important for 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 for, for things. So on the y axis is what your risk weight is, and risk weight is just eight percent of you know risk weight. So if the risk weight is hundred percent, think of the capital charge being eight percent. So you need to have eight percent of so if something comes out having a risk weight of 100%, that means that particular loan should have 8% of capital associated with it. Is that clear? Okay, so, so, th so this is on the x-axis you have the PD, which is what's the probability of a loan defaulting, uh, of a firm defaulting in a year from now, all right? The reason I say firm loan, they sort of mean the same thing for, because we're looking at corporate loans. These corporate, lo corporate loans have what is called a cross default clause in it which means a default on one loan automatically triggers default on all the other loans. Okay. So the way to think about this is if I look at a PD of 0 0.02 out here, so let's say I had ran this model of mine and it came up with a PD of 2%, the way I would determine the capital charge is I would go 2%, I would go, I would draw a line out here, let's say it meets out here, that would be 1, that means 100%, that means 8% capital. If I move on here, and it comes out that the PD is 8%, you would go up out here, the capital charge is 1.75 approximately. So the capital associated with this would be uh, 1.75 times 8, which is going to be whatever, <laughs> three-fourths of it. Yeah, something like that. Is that clear? That's how you're going to determine it. That's your calibration chart that they have given. Your models are now calculating the PD. Everything else is hardwired into it. All right. And, and I'll talk about the high to hard wiring in just a bit, but that's the thing. Now, just to give you, when you have such a non-linear schedule, it always, you know, you, 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 you always ask this question that can they be gaming in some sense? So think about the following. And it doesn't have to be because it depends on the cost of manipulation. But a delta manipulation on this side downward and a delta manipulation on the other side in the other direction can, gener can generate the average PD to be right but you still saved a lot on the risk weights because this part is a lot steeper than this part, right? So whenever you have non-linear schedules, you, you, you often wonder whether this is generating some incentives to do something. So you can look like on the portfolio, your prediction errors are totally okay, but you've, you've still saved on risk weights by doing this form of manipulation, is, is right? Okay. That's what you get from summer school of economic theory. <laughs> graphs and data. All right, um, I, 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 as I said, uh, so the data, as I already said, comes from the, the Deutsche Bank, and they have, you know, since so we're looking at corporate loans out here, you have very detailed information from the credit register. You can actually get, you know, who's giving what, et cetera, et cetera. There is going to be balance sheet and income statement for these German banks, and uh, and, and there are ways in which you can actually extract the, the interest rate. So sample period is 2004, quarter one to two, uh, 2012, but that's just some before 2008, everybody was on the SA loans. So I don't want to give you more, too much data because you like to see models and I don't have much, but I'd like to highlight what I just said earlier, which is, if you, as I said earlier, the total banks, right, that did not go for the IRB approach, these are the SA banks, that's 1,558. So the number was 45 and not 48. Uh, okay, I now remember why I was getting 148 because the next one I'm going to be presenting has 148 in it. Okay, so the, these are the largest banks. As you can see out here, if you just look at the size of these banks, right? This is the this is the mean in uh, in million of euros, uh, 2006. You can see that there. This is the mean size of the SA bank. And this is the mean size of the IRB banks. You can see that they're a lot bigger. So the IRB banks, the 45 banks, are just larger banks. All right. Uh, okay. So I'm going to I'm going to skip this uh, this stuff because we've already seen this in the graphs out here. Uh, but this would just again tell you that the SA loan. If I was to read this number, this says what's the probability of default. It would say it's 0 0.0262 on average, and the probability of default of the IRB loans is much lower, which says that IRB loans, at least based on the reported PDs, are supposed to be safer than the than the the SA loans. 
Okay, so here's yeah. Go ahead. Okay, so so what the next what was done to ensure that it's not you know you're comparing apples with oranges, right? You're not looking at IRB loans being different from SA loans and having different sensitivity to the macro factors. Is to exploit this staggered passage or the staggered adoption of the IRB. So as I said earlier these 45 largest banks that were out there, all these 45 banks, they submitted their models to the regulator. And then the regulator looked at it, they went in and they said, we are happy with this model, this can go on the model based approach, this we are not happy, we need more data, this will stay on the SA. And then two or three years later, if everything was fine, they would approve it and, and so there is this staggered implementation. But what you have in the data is, think of an SME loan, by SME I mean small, small and medium medium sized enterprises, all right. So you have, so these are both IRB banks, by IRB banks I mean one of the 45 banks that want to move to, that have raised their hands when the regulator asks who wants to shift to the model based approach. So they have submitted all their portfolios. So this, a lot of, you, you have instances in which this SME loan, right, this SME portfolio for one bank the regulator is happy and says, you know what, I will allow you to move the SME on the model based approach, all right. For another bank says, no, I am not really happy because you do not really have enough data and we are going to allow you, we will watch next year and we will revisit this discussion again and you keep submitting it and when, once we feel comfortable, we will allow that to go through. So you have instances in which you have a firm borrowing from two banks, both are these large banks. But in one case, this SME loan has moved to this IRB portfolio, so now this loan is coming from the IRB portfolio. Is that clear? Whereas for the other loan, so this has multiple lending relationship, but for the other loan, it's coming from the SME, which is still on the SA portfolio. Does that make sense? All right. So these two banks have said yes, they've submitted the models. In one case, it said yes, the other case, no. And the firm, now we're looking at firms that are borrowing from these two guys. All right. Now. So now what happens is that you can actually look at what is this person saying about the PD of this firm and what is this person saying about the PD of this firm. Does it make sense? Because these are being reported out here. So earlier we were doing IRB and SA for the aggregate, but now you are keeping the firm constant. All right? And what you see is this PD consistently is significantly lower than this PD. All right? So now I'm keeping that, you know, I'm trying to keep the same firm constant out here so that we don't have this issue of, of you know, comparing apples with oranges. So what you see is that the same patterns that you saw earlier, you also see with the same set of firms, which is this reported PD is lower than that. All right? And some of the other things also go through. Okay. Now, just to be clear, the PD measures the probability of a firm defaulting. All right? What the exposure at default is or the loss given default, whether the loan is collateralized, et cetera, or not. That goes into the risk weighted cal calculation, but is not coming into the PD. So, for example, the reason I'm, I'm emphasizing this is because a lot of people miss this. The PD here refers: Will there be a default or not? All right. Now, conditional default: If I, have, if I as a bank have given a collateralized loan, and another bank has given an uncollateralized loan, they will have different losses because the because their contract gives them seniority or protection, etc. So losses can be very different. This is just looking at what is their predicted default for this firm. So these firms, if they default, they default on all loans. Yeah, so if there's a default on one loan, it automatically triggers default on all loans. You can't selectively, like in individual loans, it's possible to do it, but not in corporate loans. So I can default on one credit card without the other company or you know, taking time, but this is this is how, 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 how it works. This is true for most countries, uh, I think all countries, the cross default clause. Uh, all I do not want to say because they are, yes? Sorry? Yeah. From the lender's perspective, correlation of default rate. The, I thought that the risk model was meant to capture this idea that if you are the risk of default of loans, then in the aggregate you are less yeah. No, so this is just so. So first of all, these all these banks are very highly diversified in general. Okay, but but 
yeah but but if you if you if you think about correlation of defaults right the way correlation of default would 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 uh, pan out and that's not reflected in the pd would be you know the average if i had enough of the time series right the average will still be the same right if there are two portfolios one highly correlated and one less correlated the average default rate would still be the same it's just that defaults would be clustered so if i have very highly you know if i have a portfolio that's very highly correlated then i'll have a lot of default at one point in time and i have no default at another point in time but the average would still be the average pd if i have a long time series right but right to the regular, yes to the back, Yes, so the bank it makes different because in one case, if you have a very highly correlated portfolio, it 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 it, it can bring down a bank, right? And, and the other case, it, it it may not, right? Because of the of the of the diversification argument. The point here is that this particular regulation, the PD calculation, is not related to that part of it. You know, right? This is this is this is not, and 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 everyone has been given a row. Now, for right or wrong reasons, all portfolios have been given a row of, you know, say 0.2, you know, and they use the Morton model, and and that's how they calculate the risk weights. But but this is hardwired into the calculations at the moment. But from bank stability, I I totally agree with you that it can matter, but it doesn't affect the reported PDs. Right. Okay. So as I was saying is that. I mean, I, you, you can believe me when I say that. That if I hold the firm constant, you get the same pattern, which is the IRB uh, bank or the IRB. Sorry, the, uh, the the if the loan comes from the IRB portfolio of the IRB banks, it reports a much lower PD uh, than this. And now, because the PDs report, reported are lower, the risk weighted assets reported are also lower because they're mapped to the risk weighted assets, uh, which is your capital charge, is a one-to-one -one mapping based on sort of this type of a chart that I showed you earlier. And that would give you the the, the 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 same thing. All right. So that's that's this is the finer part of the analysis, which says you know what? Even though the bar diagrams are quite nice, this actually tries to go a bit further and says let's hold the firm constant. And this is a bit sharper than than earlier, because if there are some movements and you know, so this probably holds the firm at least constant, and so it it mitigates some of the concerns might, that might be there. Okay. So now you can you can run some regression analysis. I'm not going to bore you with these regression specifications out here, but essentially what you're going to be looking at is with the same. Uh, so you're looking at for the same firm. So this is like a firm fixed effect that they call in econometrics, and you're looking at these 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 PDs, and you're just trying to see. So these are some fixed effects that you can put in out here, which is this is firm times year fix, quarter fixed effect. This is bank times quarter fixed effect to take care of the shocks that might be hitting these banks. And this is just the variable that we're interested in, which is, is the PD after I control for all these non-parametrically for all the of other shocks that the banks might be going through, is there a difference between the reported PDs quarter by quarter, right, on a quarter by quarter basis for the IRB versus the SA side? Is that clear? So the null would be there should be no difference. On average, maybe one time it's this way, the other time it's the other way. And what you see is that delta is if delta is whatever, the PDs reported are, are lower by the IRB portfolio. That's essentially this graph, this tables out here. All this is showing you is that there's a significant underreporting of the of the PDs by these banks. Okay. Now you can look at it in many other ways. You can see how what is the estimation error, which is reported PD versus the actual default, and you know you can calculate it because of the cross default clauses. This this is almost mechanical from last side, which is again. Not only are they reporting it less, but they're also doing worse, which is the prediction errors are higher for the IRB loans than for the SA loans. All right. Um, uh, this is what the risk weighted assets look like, which is a capital charge. And again, you can look at it like that, that those firms that are on the IRB side are actually holding their lower risk weighted assets because of the lower PD. And loss rates tend to be higher. If anything, the loss rates are higher, suggesting these are riskier loans. Probably on the other side, which is that the, these are probably less collateralized or whatever it is than these other guys. Okay, interest rates going in the same direction. So what I've done in the essential in this analysis is the following: is that taking that bar charts and actually gone at the firm level, trying to hold the firm constant, trying to establish the same results, and they sort of go through in in in, in this in this in this analysis. All right. Now there are lots of other things one could do, and I'm not going to. Uh, 
get into that, which is maybe I'll say a couple of things on that. Uh, so, you know, you can you can you can look at you know how the manipulation happens, right? So, if you remember that uh, uh, I had shown you that the mapping between the PDs and risk weights was non-linear, right? Which means that a slight manipulation of PDs at the lower end of the PD spectrum generated a big reduction in risk weights, which thereby meant a much lower tax or a capital charge, whereas manipulation in the higher end of the PD spectrum would generate less of that. And you actually find the same thing, which is banks actually manipulated more on the down where the slope was steeper than it was. In fact, it was offset by that. So a lot of times the portfolio might look okay, but there's still manipulation going on in the cross section. Uh, the cohort test is a test where you know you could look at when these loans were originated, okay, by the same bank, and you see before the the portfolio got shifted into the model base side, you know the models were doing well, it is only on the new loans that originated afterwards, there seems to be, there seems to be an issue. I will say one thing on the IRB versus advanced IRB side of it, which is that um, there were a few banks that were actually given, so you know I had mentioned earlier that PD was the main variable, loss given default and correlation of default and other things were actually hardwired by the regulator. The very, very large banks were actually allowed to even model the loss giving defa loss given default. And the argument to the regulator was that we have been in this for a long time, we actually are better at modeling loss given default than what you are giving us as the hardwired parameter. All right? So this, cons this is putting constraints on us because your loss given default is not right. Interestingly, those that moved to what is called the advanced model based approach, which means they had more discretion, they can even model not just the PD, they can model even the loss given default, which we as academics struggle. All right, they even manipulated more, had lower risk weights, and had much higher risk. So the more discretion accorded to, to these guys uh, generated. Now, Eric, to your question, there was a bit of a business cycle, and you see these patterns exist around the base business cycle, but it was not as steep as what we've seen, for example, in the U.S. I think I might have a graph on. Yeah, this is how your cycle sort of looks like. So you know. There is there is a bit of a there is a dip in that sense, but it's not as severe, and then it recovers quite quickly. So this is where it started, and this is where the Lehman crash happened, and, and it continued for a while. But Germany had a, a lesser one, and it, a lot of the German thing came from these Landesbank holding subprime mortgages in the U.S., which is a very uh, interesting phenomena. Okay, um, so I'm going to uh, a few more minutes, so I'm going to. Now, if you look at, if you look at who are the, yeah. So, um, looking at the shape of the relationship between the total return of the curve and the capital charge, right, it seems very complicated. I would have thought, and I don't know anything about it, that if anything it should maybe be come back. Do you know a little bit about this? Yeah, so this is a, this, this is, this is a schedule given by the regulator. I have looked at the equation, but it comes from some sort of a, you know, it, it's a portfolio diversification type of, I don't know how they've, there, there is a model I can't remember right now, but but it's it's they can blame us for giving them that type of an analysis as well. Uh, but uh, I don't know why an increasing. You're saying that that the higher the exponentially. Uh, The rate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, sorry, PD hundred percent is just the actual default. It's like a loan has already. Yeah, that's. But you write off that loan if it wants this hundred percent. Just to be clear on this, right? Most of the loans in this stuff are from, you know, have zero point between zero point zero zero one and zero point zero zero four five. You know, there are few which which tend to be in the zero point five. But those are the ones that that the default is quite imminent or something has happened and they've been negotiated. So as you saw the spectrum, right? Even when I went to zero point zero eight or whatever, right? That's so it's it's 
it's it's it's it's not that high. These different. Sorry. Uh, no, so renegotiate. Yeah, so there is there is some aspect in which could banks evergreen some loans to you know to avoid what you were saying, which is high default, which would then mean the higher high write off. A high write off would then mean somehow you need to raise capital to be back on this, you know. And there is this instance where the firms are doing. Uh, there is some evidence and it is less, but it is plausible. And the renegotiation one is to do it for economic reasons, renegotiation. The other is just to do it to avoid uh, capital charge, for example. Uh, by that, no, I meant that uh, one for, yeah, it is an economic reason, sorry. But what I meant was one being you know, uh, an efficient renegotiation, the other also being efficient but for the wrong reasons. <laughs> you know what I am trying to say, right? The one is you are bypassing regulation by doing that because the regulation would make you re realize those losses and then you will have to, you know, provision for those losses. The other is, the other is uh, different which is this firm is hit by a liquidity shock, needs some sort of renegotiation but we know it is a positive NPV going forward. The other is a negative NPV firm but we let it, we let it carry on life support. That's what I mean as a distinguishing inefficient liquidation versus inefficient continuation type of. But you're right. From a firm's perspective, it's an optimal decision in both scenarios. Okay. Um, so here's how it played out, right? So I've shown you this, right? Uh, I was talking about the fixed costs. Okay. Now what you what you find out here, and the way to just treat this graph is not much. This thing is that there, of course, demand is that once this reform was implemented, what happened was these large banks benefited from this reform because what happened was they had these lower PDs being revoted, lower risk weighted, the loss rates were higher. So in some sense, as I was saying earlier, what you what you created for these large banks are less capital but riskier portfolios. So it went in the opposite direction, right? It's not it was not the steering effect that the regulators intended, which is to take them towards safer portfolios and lower capital. Right? Big banks who went for this, these are the big banks, they expanded their lending which is what you were saying, right, which might be a good thing, at the expense of smaller banks. So big banks in the data in Germany actually grew bigger. So if you look at some measure of concentration of banks, right, there, you know, Herfindahl, et cetera, the banking market after this reform, after this capital regulation on become, became more concentrated, big became bigger, all right, which is interesting, as I said earlier, the whole idea of, you know, these, some of these regulations, you know, makes think about financial stability you know and one way of thinking about systemic risk is too big to fail. So this you could think because of the high fixed costs, you saw that these the large banks who went for it, they manipulated some of these models. They don't like the word manipulated by the way whenever I say it, they said optimized the models because these are rules that are given, we are not doing something wrong, right? It's like when the you know government says this is the tax schedule, we pay taxes based on the rules. So you know uh, they were asked to optimize and there were a lot of people like McKinsey etc in the business who were consulting and telling how to optimize. So I should use the word optimize rather than manipulated. But they optimized once these models were in place and they were approved by the regulator, they optimized it and that generated uh, uh, risk weights that were lower but higher uh, risk. Yeah. Yes. So the question is whether this is a temporary phenomenon. I mean, as Gur pointed out earlier. To get more data, it shows that the model is not well calibrated or whatever. Right. And you integrate the new data. Yeah. And then next, we will be better. I mean, the regulator will be better. Yeah, but 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 this is why, as Gur pointed, it's interesting that at some point you would think that maybe it's a one year off, one or two years. It's not really converging, right? That was the initial comment in the bar diagram. Wasn't that your, right, right? That was interesting. And I think what's really happening is that even if the regulator picks up and tries to tweak the model, right, once these models are in place, it's very easy for banks to, you know, there's so much subjectivity goes into this. How do you rate the credit risk? There are a lot of subjective parameters. Rate it, you know, 10 for excellent, 8 for very good. You know, what does that mean even, right? It, 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 one, one, one thing is that. The second thing is once the model in place, and I know, 
that these are the characteristics that are going to load favorably for my capital charges. You know, even if I have adverse news, I don't have the incentives to reveal that news in my in my reported PDs, because you know I see this loan looks good on these four dimensions, which gives me a lower risk weight. I'm going to originate this. So my behavior changes once the this is what I was you know referring to the the good heart law, the Klukas critique type of an argument. You know, once this is in place, I have the incentives to originate loans that load up on this because it's an incentive to do that. And if there is some adverse information, I just don't share it. Uh, uh, so, what this, what, what this, uh, yeah, go ahead. Just, just super quick, uh, just to make sure, here we're not seeing anything uh, with respect to risk exposure. So, we're thinking like banks had the same risk exposure as before, just they were able to, the big banks, they were able to uh, hold, uh, have like less capital cost for each loan that they were yeah. issuing, and hence they were able to take some from, from the smaller bank, right? Yes. No, but what you also see, and I hope I have a table on that, what you also see is that if you look at the, the risk-weighted assets, which is essentially or capital charge, the, so even though the portfolios are safer, uh, sorry, riskier, the risk weight, the capital charges are lower. So they're going in, the, in a different direction. So banks, if you were to compare banks in the SA regime versus the new regime, the SA regime means prior to the model-based regulation, they would have a certain amount of capital and a certain amount of risk. Now they have a lower amount of capital and a higher amount of risk. Realized risk. Yeah. Like because from their model yeah, they're defaulting more, and the, 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 yeah, in terms of realized risks. All right. Now uh, this is just saying that big banks have benefited from this, uh, and you can see this result being statistically significant. This is just plotting the Herfindahl index, which is a measure of, measure of market concentration, and I already said that banks are more concentrated. Okay. Now, now in terms. Yeah. Um, Big banks benefited in the sense that they got lower capital charges and you know, they could make more loans. You haven't said anything about what happened to their profits. It may, it may be, you, know, you could imagine that their defaults went up so much that that, that uh, counteracted the, uh, the fact that they had lower capital. Charges. So I should have mentioned, there is, yeah, the profits of the banks also went up of these large banks. There is. Yeah. That is, yeah, absolutely. That fair enough. Yeah, exactly. I should have. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, you could have an offsetting effect with high risk, but the interest rate more more than made up for this. Okay, this is what I was talking about: complexity of regulation. So I've just shown you some dimensions, at least how this complex regulation has played out. I was mentioning earlier. So in the 1970s, and this is the exact data: Bank of England performed supervision with 30 employees. You know, I was showing these numbers. Okay. Uh, yeah. That's a, this is, by the way, coming from Andy Haldane's paper, who's at the who's at, who's at the Bank of England. Uh, okay, and, and so he says one UK regulatory for every 300 people employed in finance, compared to one in 11,000 people working. All right. And the current trend, if you ask them, right, is that they need more resources, more people, because that's the way to to model this. This that's the way to uh, enforce this complicated regulation, which, uh, okay, this is what happens for regulatory reporting. Yes. And in fairness, financial itself became more complex, and the real estate yeah. is an old instrument that is just really boosting in 1970. Fair enough. No, so I, I'm not, you know, this is, and this is for the discussion, right? Maybe this is, maybe the response of, you know, this is just a, a response to the growth in the complexity of the financial system. And, uh, Yes, financial system has become more complex. There's been a lot of financial innovation. Some of the financial innovation has been genuine. Some of it is driven by regulatory arbitrage, uh, you know, which is how do I bypass it, right? There's bad regulation and people come up with innovative products, argue that it helps you complete markets because markets are incomplete, but a lot of it is just ways of bypassing things. You know, even for example, securitization, a lot of people talk about, right? Uh, you know, what, what it was was just a way in which they could offset regulation because it could be an off-balance sheet activity. They didn't have to put any capital charges aside to this. So this is just, there is no clear answer with what is the right amount. You know, there's no, but deni there's no denying that complexity of financial system has increased. But there are some staggering numbers out here which says, you know, what do we want? Do we want one bank, one person working in banking and another guy sitting next to him and supervising that individual? Would that be the optimal? I, I don't know. It looks like these numbers already 
one in every 300 people. But you know, uh, just to talk about regulatory reporting that comes with it, you know, in 1974 you had 150 entries on an annual basis. Today, you know, you have, you know, the discussion at least is about 30 to 40 thousand, and the banks are just, you know, spending a huge amount of resources in just doing this. And all this data, it's not even sitting and being used. Nobody can look at it, right? It's going to be just sitting somewhere and maybe something good comes out of this. But anyway, if all this is useful and it avoids the next crisis, that's, that, that's fantastic. Though I don't even know whether we should have the objective of avoiding crisis. You know, having, a, as you said, <laughs> avoiding crisis is, can be too costly. You know, the idea of, uh, you know, one very simple approach to that is make banks very safe and men, not make them lend at all, and that's going to be counterproductive as well. Anyway, um, compliance, compliance costs, a recent study by McKinsey puts the compliance cost for bank as 200 full-time jobs. Uh, okay? Now, a lot of people talk in, in, in finance about you know, empire building, you know, Jensen's empire building, all right? But actually, regulators are having a very good time as well. Bundes, Bundesbank has expanded its, its, its reach, you know? And they're not, you know, more, so, you know, maybe there is something as regulatory empire building because, you know, more supervisors and, and stuff like that, and that's what, what's driving it. I actually wanted to mention an example from, um, from field hockey, something that's very close to my, my, this thing, which is very, very similar to this. To, to this. So, uh, you know, field, so I'm sure all of you know field hockey as opposed to ice hockey. Uh, so, you know, Earlier, field hockey was playing or played on normal grounds, right? And uh, very short. Uh, and if you look at you know which were the good teams playing field hockey at that point in time, right? The major players. India used to be a major player in field hockey. That's where the example comes from, right? So if you look at the Olympic gold medals and stuff like that, India hardly wins anything. But field hockey was something they would they would normally win, and they were very good at dribbling. So field hockey requires some skills. All right, and, and, and dribbling was something that was very important there. So if you look at the Olympic gold medals, you know, Asia was very strong in field hockey. In 1970s, it was realized that you know, field hockey required a lot of skill and you know, the ground can be sometimes uneven. And because uneven, you require more of this stuff. So what we're going to do is we're going to introduce something called AstroTurf. All right? And this seems like a good way to do it because we don't want this unevenness that prevents passing from taking place to be... Uh, to be a deterrent. And so what they did was they passed the legislation, a rule, where, where hockey now is going to be placed on AstroTurf. Now this was a very con expensive equipment because you needed to have, the, first of all, the equipment, ha you know, had, the, the AstroTurf was costly for, for, for a lot of countries. It had to be maintained on a regular basis, amount of water, etc. Then you to play, a lot of Indians were used to playing without shoes. That's what they could afford at that point in time. And this required special shoes, all right, special equipment. And so a country like India for a long time had just one stadium uh, in, the entire, in the entire country. And the players who would go for the Olympics or wherever, they would only be able to step on that, you know, for just, bef just to practice before the Olympic game or something like that because it was, it was very costly. But individuals could not play. So there's some statistics like India for a long time had just one stadium like that. And a country like, Amp uh, like uh, Netherlands, for example, had, this, had such facilities in schools. So they had some 60, 70 stadiums in a small country like that. And what happened was when this AstroTurf was, was introduced, you just see in the data that suddenly it shifted the, su the hockey superpower from Asia to Europe. All right? And it created a huge, uh, so this is my <laughs> costly, <laughs> costly <laughs> example of a co No, 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 I, no, no, no. All right? And what happened was that, you know, if you look at the, the medal tally, it has shifted in a, in a, in a very strong, uh, you know, towards, towards Europe. Now what has happened is that when India has grown, now there are more stadiums out there. But, you know, there's a big void being created, which is, which is that, you know, there isn't a generation now ready to train the next generation because it's totally gone. And now cricket has become the most important uh, game for whatever reason. And there's World Cup going on right now, by the way. But, uh, so, you know, you can have, you know, even though in the context it looks very simple, right, these, these fixed costs sometimes can generate huge shifts and here, a change in the way a game is played, hockey, generated a massive shift in, 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 in that stuff, very similar to what you see with capital regulation out here. Okay, so I'm going to, um, to end uh, this, but just to summarize it, and I think I'm 
pretty much on time. So you see in this simple example of this complex regulation, regulation provided an implicit subsidy to side. Big banks gained at the expense of, 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 of small banks. All right? And the question is that when it comes to thinking about the complexity of regulation, always our reaction is, let's get more, let's get more, let's get more, let's get more resources to supervise it. And maybe the discussion has to shift towards, can we undo of some bad regulation and simplify certain things? That way we can perhaps get more governance, that way we can get you know, everybody understanding things. Simpler rules might be more effective than complex rules. Okay. I'll stop out here uh, and uh, take any questions that you might have. Um, yes. That doesn't mean I have answers to them, <laughs> but <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, the fact that they report, I mean, I, 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 I don't know what that means. I mean, first of all, misreporting in general is bad. You're saying that, oh, safer loans have a lower probability of defaulting. I think the safer loans are more systemic prone because these default when the bank goes down, if anything, right? So these are, I mean, one could argue in the other way as well, uh, this and then. Yeah, go ahead. It's you first. Yeah. Sure. No, so one thing I would just like to say is that, you know, I don't want to make any welfare implications out here from just this analysis. You know, maybe there are some unintended effects and this, guy, this could generate some good things as well. My point is, what is the stated objective of this reform and are you getting some unintended effects from that stated objective? And that's the attempt of this exercise, right? Which is you wanted to create safer banks, you wanted the risk weights to be more responsive to the risk. Right, and you weren't able to achieve that, and 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 then the second thing is I, I, the reason why I'm trying to say that if you think that the going forward is, which is a lot of others are doing, which is we couldn't enforce it because we didn't have a lot of manpower to pay, pay with, my message is generally that, you know, you really can't deal with that this type of a thing because regulators will always be slower than the regulator. The incentive structures is, is such, uh, you can also say the talent level is such, right? And at some point, it's just simple. You know, maybe making it simpler could be a discussion to be had I, without having an answer to that. But yes. Is there a reason why regulators don't? Yeah. Yeah, but exactly. So this is exactly the kind of thought I wanted to leave you with, which is can one think of, maybe Eric could help us as well, can one design, you know, mechanisms or something like that which actually allows the regulators to create what is called a manipulation proof uh, regulation, right? What would that be, you know? others reporting, how does regulator respond to people reporting with different PDs, what are the punishment schemes associated with that and uh, you know, that's, that's the whole idea, right? I mean, which, what should be the optimal regulation and I think that's, there's still a lot of work to be done on that, yes, sorry. Yeah. 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 
the thing is a lot of times this is again about what type of punishment schemes you want because a lot of times they could be genuine cases of 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 mismeasurement right and uh, and and a lot of capital charge or punishment can generate failures as well right so so i'm saying is that no but this is where this is where it becomes is what's the right because it's noisy right these pds can't be right um, I mean, this is a basic idea of providing incentives you want to the business of the bank is to provide an estimation yeah yeah but Yeah, but I think it's a bit. So I totally see your argument, but I think that the implementation of this, one has to think a bit more on what it means if suddenly bank, uh, you know, uh, in terms of capitalization. So in theory, yes, it means it makes sense that you know if you want them to come closer, there must be some punishment scheme, not at the loan level perhaps, but at the end for at the portfolio level, you got so much wrong. There must be some way. To, yeah, uh, there could be a scheme that could generate some true telling based on that or less. Manipulation in equilibrium, and uh, and those are the topics that need to be, to be thought about. But the regulators are struggling. It's very easy for me to point out what went wrong. Yeah. The tough thing in this is for the theorists to come and say, is like how should we think about ways of fixing it, and that is, and and there are some proposals out there on some lines like that, and some have been thrown away. Some are, but but, I don't think we we have that sort of a formal structure yet to, yeah. but but they are sort of very interesting areas. Uh, to be thought about when it comes to bank regulation and you know these banks are generating a lot of credit and you know so, yeah. so it's a huge it's a very important uh, thing yes uh, i'm just um, i'm thinking is there a sense do we have a sense of uh, where was the manipulation uh, in the sense i'm thinking for example in going from from the sa to the erb yeah. uh, was i uh, able to eliminate to part to make the model much more partial and so eliminate uh, uh, I don't know the systemic risk that I would uh, have by uh, issuing this loan to this firm. Like I, I decrease the the risk of the loan because I focus only on certain aspects of the cash flows of the specific firm and I I totally delink it from from the business cycle for example and in, in this way I can claim. Uh, uh, this loan is actually less risky, so this, that's the PD that I get out. So, so you think, how did I manipulate this? What did I like do what, what as a bank? The, yeah, what is what is what is in a sense the risk that was not priced anymore in passing from the SA to the ERP? So, so you know, one of the stuff that I didn't go through, in, which was which is what I was calling cohort analysis, seems to suggest that it's just that it's it's banks were just originating differently. So it's it's like manipulation optimization happening once the model gets approved and 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 you know originating loans that load up favorably on those dimensions to avoid risk weights rather than anything else so once they know this is what my schedule is going to be this is going to be known to everyone uh, you know and uh, so it'll favor certain types of loans over the other type of loans and that would generate that's what's generating it so rather than trying to decrease the outstanding they were setting the model such that afterwards they would issue so there's all that discussion also happening which is now banks have optimization departments uh, we can talk maybe after because i, I think that yeah, we, should. we should but should but continue but, over the break yeah absolutely yeah. all right thank you, thank you so much, much. Thank you. All right,